Hello everyone, I'm going to start in a moment. Okay, let's get started. Oops. Something's wrong with my keyboard, which is a little bit annoying. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay. So the idea today is that I'm going to try this streaming thing, which I've never done before. I'm Karl Friedrich Bolster Eich. I'm one of the PyPy core devs. And um, uh, so what I'm trying to do tonight is to uh, try to see whether we can add um, the walrus operator or the assignment, is also called the assignment expression to PyPy. PyPy is currently supporting um, the CPython version 3.6, uh, 3.7, and uh, the Walrus operator is a 3.8 feature. So um, in the future, we are, we're, we're hoping to also support 3.8, so um, adding the Walrus operator is a nice first step. So let's see, what do we need? Here's my PyPy checkout, and I'm going to pull to, to make sure I have an up-to-date repository. Um, and this is going to be based uh, off the Py 3.7 branch. Um, so let's update to that. And uh, since it, um, the work shouldn't be going immediately to that branch, let's make a new branch. Um, uh, some 3.8 features. I mean, I could also make a walrus uh, operator specific branch, but maybe we can add uh, a couple of other 3.8 features in that branch. So let's give it a somewhat more generic name. Um, okay, so to understand a little bit how the walrus op operator works, it makes sense to look at how CPython, do CPython does it. Oops, which Python do I have there? Three. Um, to 3.8.0, whatever. Okay, and to figure out how it works, we can define a small function and use an assignment expression there. We need to parenthesize it because otherwise it's an assignment expression. Um, it's, a, it's a statement and a statement cannot be an assignment expression. So 12. Return x, uh, and now we can disassemble it to look at what uh, bytecode CPython generates for that function. Um, and we see that it basically it gets compiled away to completely regular bytecodes. So we we load the right hand side with a load const twelve, and then there's a dub top, mm, and then we have a store fast which writes to the variable x, and then we have a pop top because we don't actually use the result of that expression. So what, why is the dub top necessary? It's necessary because um, if this occurs in a somewhat large, larger context we, where we actually do any, something with the right-hand side, we need the dub top because the store fast bytecode consumes um, yeah, the top element of the stack. And we can see why the dub top ne is necessary if we do something slightly more complicated and say print x. X, and if we disassemble this, we see that we we load print, we load twelve, we dub top, we duplicate the top element, then we store it under X, which pops one of the elements, and then we call the function with one argument, which is going to consume the other copy of the twelve, and then we have a pop top, which pops the re result of the print. Um, Okay, and then we have a return down here. So, so that's that's the kind of bytecode that um, that the assignment expression will generate. 
and um, we can see that the assignment expression is a completely surface feature. It's only syntax. It doesn't need any new bytecodes or anything. So um, the only code that we're going to have to touch to, uh, to implement it is, is the parser and the bytecode compiler. Um, okay. Uh, and I'm not really going into super detailed uh, information about the, the PyPy directory structure. If there's interest in that, please let me know in the comments. Um, hi, Ronan. Um, and, uh, but the, the directory that we need to get started is um, the interpreter directory. Um, so here there, uh, in the PyPy sub directory here is where the Python interpreter is implemented. And the interpreter directory is concerned with uh, the bytecode interpreter and parsing and the bytecode compiler and stuff like that. So that's where we're going to start. And the first thing we need is we need to teach the lexer about um, about the new token that we have, which is the colon equal token. So let's go to the parser. That's the pyparser directory. And um, the first thing we, we always do is write a test. So we can go to the test subdirectory and, and check what files there are. And there's a pytokenizer file there, which tests the, to the Python tokenizer. And we're going to add a test there that the um, that the new token is is being generated um, uh, is being uh, recognized by the tokenizer. Um, right. There's a there's a, a question about how the symbol table handles that, and and you're correct. Uh, we also ha we're also going to have to uh, make sure that that um, the assignment expression counts as an assignment. And I actually don't quite know how that works yet. I, I didn't actually look at the C Python implementation at all. I'm just going to start and, and see um, where we're getting. Mm. But starting with the token is, is a safe bet because we, we need that in any case. So I opened the, the tokenizer file here and it, it has stuff like, okay, we tests that look like this. We talk, we're tokenizing this, this line here, A plus one and it gets tokenized into a name token, a plus token, a number token, two new lines and an end marker. And, um, and we're, we're going to add a similar test like that. So let's copy that, go to the end, and then we can have a test walrus and look like this. And it should tokenize to something like, um, Okay, I'll leave off, off the white space that makes counting easier. It's a name. It's uh, um, we're going to have to figure out what what the name of the token is. Maybe colon equal, um, and the string of that token is plus e uh, is colon equal, and it's still in line one at offset one. That looks correct, and then we have a number one, uh, which is uh, has the string one, which is correct in line one. But the offset is going to be three because colon equal is uh, two characters wide. And then we have the same new line, new line, end marker um, uh, tokens that get uh, appended to every input. Okay, and then, then we can we can try what uh, to see what happens when we run this test. Um, okay. So there's this test all file in the uh, in the Piper directory which behaves like uh, PyTest or, or like an old fork of PyTest. Um, and we're going to run that on the file that we just edited. No, PyParser, test, test, PyTokenizer, uh, Walrus. Let's just run the, um, the new test. And let's see what happens. takes a bit because all the PYC files need to be generated because I check, checked out a new uh, 3.7 branch and before I was on the default branch. So uh, it takes a while to get started the first time. Though this seems a little bit excessive. Let's see what's happening. Right. 
Okay, the first uh, problem is kind of obvious. We, we didn't declare this new um, token type, so it, it, it crashes here. Um, when we define the list that, we could, that we're trying to compare against. But if we look at the tokens that it's currently tokenizing, then we see that it, it tokenizes the uh, colon and the equal in two separate tokens. The colon token, which already exists for, uh, for this kind of uh, colon and the equal token. Um, right, so this is wrong, and, and that means we need to do several things. We need to define the new token type, and we need to um, we need to uh, fix the tokenizer to, to produce this new token. So where do the tokens come from? I keep forgetting that. It's called pygram. E by parser. Oops. Pygram. And the tokens come from somewhere else. Uh, pi parser, pi token. Hmm. Let's see. Right. And here we have the tokens, and this is pretty similar to the um, to the standard library uh, file token.py, and we're going to look at that file in the 3.8 branch of CPython. So here's my CPython checkout, um, and let's go to the 3.8 branch, um, and we can look at token.py here, or we can also... Uh, and see whether colon equal, right. Um, so I guessed the name of the token correctly and it comes after ellipsis and, and before op. Let's see what C Python does here. Uh, Python does here. Um, ellipsis and op. So let's put it here at talk colon equal and it's colon equal. Uh, I don't know what the convention here is for single or double quotes. Uh, okay, like this. So now we at least know the name of the token. Um, so let's see. If I run the test again. And we, we haven't actually fixed anything. The, the tokenizer still doesn't know about that token, I think. So um, nothing really changed, but we st should still fail a little bit further. Right, we can define the right-hand side of the comparison, but of course the comparison itself still fails because we still don't generate the token. So now we need to understand how the tokenizer works. And I don't really completely understand how it works, but um, we can at least look at it. Uh, I think it's in here. Oops. Let's see. Something's a bit strange with my Vim recently in that it freezes. I'm not sure with which um, plugin causes that. Yeah, I don't really get why the tokenizer's test takes so long to start up. I would expect them to be fairly independent of all the other machinery. I mean, in general, it's, the, it's definitely the case that on some tests take a while to start up because everything's in Python. So um, there's a lot of uh, setup code that, that gets run. Um, so sometimes it takes a while. But for the tokenizer, I'm a bit confused because um, I would be expecting that, expecting that it doesn't take ages, really. So there's a file called py Py uh, tokenize and Py tokenizer. I'm not really sure what what is what. Ah, this looks more like to maybe. What is Py parser DFA generated? Hmm. So there's some auto generated file that we may may have to regenerate using this command. Let's try that. I'm in the wrong directory, I think. Mm, of course, um, that's annoying. So now it regenerates the lexer, which is 
taking a little bit and let's see okay that didn't change anything so we need to do more so let's look at what gen dfa actually does right okay so so this is basically a, a strange file that contains non-regex syntax versions of um, regexes. Uh, so th this is basically a strange way to write a regular expression which defines the tokens. And I think if we do something like this here, a new token that we want is colon equal, that might actually work. It's part of the funny group, which is definitely appropriate, I think. Right, and, and down the, here we have stuff like plus equal and minus equal and stuff like that, so, so it can definitely go there. So let's regenerate again. Right, and now the generated file, which is basically a, a finite state machine, contains some new states and some new transitions. So something definitely happened, and we can try to rerun the test. Um, this test by tokenizer. All this. Right, maybe that worked. But yeah, I agree that it's definitely slow and I'm, I don't completely understand why it's that slow. Okay, our first test passes, that's great. Let's look at the diff. Okay, we have some, some junk in the auto-generated um, finite state machines that tokenize the Python code. And then we, uh, we defined a new um, a regular expression in the code that generates that finite state machine here, which uh, defines the token colon equal and we we also had to define the new co um, token type called colon equal consisting of the string colon equal and we wrote a test that checked that it works. Okay, that's great. So the tokenizer is done. Um, and yeah, we, I mean, PyPy likes sort of uh, uh, granular small commits, so we can, we might as well commit that. And let's say um, start with the walrus operator uh, tokenizing works. Uh, okay, let's do that. Great. So the next step is the parser. And for the parser, we're um, at the moment, PyPy still uses the grammars of CPython. It will have to stop doing that because the new um, pack parser of CPython contains all the C code, which we can't use. So we, we're going to have to sort of uh, change a, a use a modified version of the parser but right now in the in the old parser it really can use the the grammar of cpython basically directly and it's it's a 3.7 grammar and i mean one approach would be that we swap immediately to the complete 3.8 grammar but that also might contain other features that that we have would have a harder time supporting so what i'm going to do instead is sort of trying to look at the cpython 3.8 uh, grammar and try to figure out what what we're going to have to do uh, to uh, support just the um, just the walrus operator. So let's go here. I keep forgetting um, where the grammar is stored in grammar. Okay, that's kind of obvious. Um, okay, so we can open that. C Python uh, grammar grammar. That's the 3.8 grammar. And we can look for, I oh know it's spelled like this, I think, right. Um, okay, so this is one of the things that we're going to have to sort of steal and take over. Uh, to answer the question in the chat, um, yeah, we're going to have to support the, the new peg parser eventually, but I mean, we're still at 3.7 and, and it's only um, I think it's only introduced in 3.9, so it, it's going to take a while. But eventually, um, 
we are planning to switch to the new parser generator. I mean, to a different parser generator that's compatible with the C Python pack parser because otherwise, otherwise it would be annoying um, to sort of support all the new features that only really make sense in the pack parser in our um, current parser, which is LL1, like C Python's old parser. Um, Right, Mati, I'm not really sure whether it's that important. I mean, not equal is also its own thing. It this is really just a syntax to to to, um, to define the regular expression. I don't really think it matters whether it's defined down here or um, as its own thing up here. Yeah, I mean, in in the end, the the, the proper tokens comes out comes out. So I don't. Uh, I don't think I'm, I care too much. Okay, so this is the C Python grammar, and this is one of the new productions that we need. Uh, here's another one in the argument parsing. Uh, right, those are the two rules that mention the colon equal. Um, right. Okay, that's interesting. Parso, parso. I don't. I'm not really that familiar with it. It's a, it's a version independent parser for Python syntax, correct? I think our goal will be to, uh, I mean, the pack parser of CPython already has a Python backend. Um, and our plan would be to uh, take that and change it quite radically, probably, to not produce Python, but produce our Python code. And then we can use the pack parser generator to take the CPython grammar and spit out. Um, and spit out uh, Python code. That that's kind of the hope. Um, and yeah, maybe we can. I've already talked with the uh, Truffle Python people, who also said that they are going to have to support uh, the new uh, parser eventually. Maybe we can join forces a little bit there. I'm actually a little bit grumpy with C Python's um, way to approach things there because the new grammar really has this annoying property that it contains actions, parsing actions in C in the grammar file, and that makes the grammar file a lot less versatile. I mean, the old grammar file was really re reusable across uh, different sort of parsing systems, and the new grammar file is much more closely tied to CPython because it it has all this C code in line, which I personally find not very satisfying. I mean, I, I, I get why they did it, because for CPython only it's very convenient, but um, for all the other um, projects that consume Python grammars, it's, it's really uh, a huge hassle and makes merging much harder and make, makes everything much harder. So yeah, I'm not, I mean, from the wider community perspective, I think the new pack parser is a step backwards. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I still understand why, why it happened. Um, right, yeah, that's, that's sad. Um, <laughs> sad that the, that the pack thing doesn't really support proper error recovery. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think at the moment you you don't have a huge problem yet because um, because C Python doesn't really have features that go beyond LL1, but the the goal is to to have some of them that uh, later that go beyond LL1 and then and then all these alternative uh, projects, also lots of editors are really very annoyed and and yeah, I'm personally I'm also not particularly happy with that decision, but. Um, yeah, I didn't complain loudly enough at the time or something. Okay, so but let's 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 continue and try to see where we have to hack our own uh, grammar and uh, to get our own 3.7 grammar to get in just this new feature. Um, so I'm opening um, maybe I can split. I can open it here. So this is the C Python one, and I'm going to open the PyPy one here. Uh, data, grammar, various grammars here, 3.7. Um, right, so we need named expression, named expression test, um, which or should go here. So that's the one new rule that we need. The other new rule that we need is uh, in the argument parsing, I'm not really sure we can easily take that over. Whoops. Let's see. Right, argument parsing became a lot more complicated. Oh no, wait, I'm in the wrong place. No, it, it didn't. 
Um, right, so there is test colon equal test. Great. Um, that's good. And so the argument part is done. And so the only other thing we need to do is um, named expert test is, is go look at the places where um, the new grammar is, is calling the named exp expression test rule compared to the test rule that the, that the old grammar uses. Um, so, and there are a few places where we're, where we're going to have to patch if statement, um, right. So here it's a named expert test. Um, actually, let me highlight that. Mm, and here it is. No, wait. There and while statement takes a named expert test now. Um, Okay, where else? We have that. And then we need to look at test list comp, which is down here, and replace that test. And um, that test. Right, and I suspect that's it. Okay, so now we changed um, the parsing rules to use the new production that is for. Um, for uh, the new Walters operator. Um, so the next step is basically we parse stuff and then we turn the syntax tree, which is a concrete syntax tree, into an abstract syntax tree. And in the abstract syntax tree, there's a new node type, which is, is called named expression, as far as I know. And so we're going to need to support that as well. Actually, I probably should start with a test for the AST stuff. It's, otherwise, I'm a little bit too much in the dark. So maybe here, AST compiler test AST, right? What does that do? I'm not completely sure that's the right file. Let me think. Um, yeah, there's, there's probably a better file that's called. But my, my Vim is frozen again. There's some, as I said, there's a weird plugin that freezes it occasionally, which is very annoying. Uh, looking at the chat, um, oh, it's cool. So maybe if we get to the multi-line with statements, we should just steal what Parso has been doing. Um, test, 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 builder. Right. Um, named expert. I called the other one walrus, so I suppose I should call this one walrus too. Thanks, Julian. I might try that. Um, so we're getting the AST for something like this. Right. And then we have the expert and that is the first. Mm, right. And what we want to say is that this should be, let's start simple, this should be an, uh, an, is in, an instance of ast.named expert, which is a new class that doesn't exist yet. So is there an AST, um, is the AST module is imported, great. So we can start with that and then and in a later step we, we are going to have to check what the um, attributes of that new, new AST node are going to be. But let's first run that and see how it crashes. So it's in AST compiler. AST builder. Hi, Victor. Nice to see you. Wow, that looks scary. Right. 
okay, the AST builder crashes and the AST builder says, okay, I'm trying to handle an expression and I, I don't actually know what the, what the expression node type is, something. Um, right, it's the new named expression expression that the AST builder, which is taking the concrete syntax tree and turning it into, into an abstract syntax tree, uh, it doesn't actually know uh, what to do with that expression, so that's that's going to be the problem that we're going to have to to solve in in a moment. Um, but the other problem that that we are going to have to so solve uh, before we do that is we're going to uh, have to define the new um, AST type, and um, that we do that by uh, editing a specific file which is in tools, I think. So C Python has this this um, AST definition uh, language, uh, ASDL, and um, it takes uh, in this kind of file and it produces um, some C code that defines all the, the AST nodes that exist. And we support the same input file and produce a Python code from that. And so similar to what we did with the, um, what we did with the uh, grammar, just copying some of the bits over to support the name expression, we're going to do the same thing about um, the new AST type. And um, so let's, similar to the grammars, let's open the two ASDL files, new AST compiler tools, Python ASDL, and split with C Python, 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 no, wait, where was it? Parser, Python ASDL. There we go, and there are various changes, but the one that the only one that we're caring for right now is what's it called? Uh, ah, wait. Okay, they're the other way around. So we're this is C Python. Um, wait, I'm going to switch that to make it less confusing. Right. Okay, so there's a new expression. Um, expr equal right. And we're going to uh, copy over that AST node type to our own version uh, variant of python.asdl. And um, then we will get the new AST, um, AST type. And to, to get that, we are, we're going to have to rerun the ST generation, and I don't remember how that works, but I hope that there is a comment here generated by tools asdl.py. So maybe it's enough to run that. Um, right. Right. And if we look at the diff of that file, we can see that there's now a new generated Python class that takes uh, the two fields that the, the AST definition language showed us, the target, the value, and it also always has a line number and a column offset. And then it also defined um, various helper methods, particularly the visitor methods. Um, right. So now we have the AST node and the next step is we're going to have to generate this AST node. Right. And we do that by, we can rerun the test again um, and look at where it failed. It was in, in uh, test, te no, in AST builder. The AST builder is the component that takes the concrete syntax tree and uh, transforms it into the abstract syntax tree, throwing out all the extra tokens that, that the AST doesn't really store. So, and there is, should be something about expressions here. Maybe a method called handle expression or something. Right, that looks promising. Um, let's see. Expert. Right. And it has various cases. Um, and I think that's actually where we failed. Right, we fail indeed in the handle expr method, and we fail with um with an assertion error that says unknown expression. 
Uh, right. Okay. So this is complicated. This is this is very scary code. Um, this is super scary code that sort of carefully mirrors the structure of the grammar and um, and sort of follows along and, and takes the information uh, out of the, the the concrete syntax nodes and, and produces AST nodes. And I'm very scared anytime I have to touch it. Um, and uh, right. Basically, we're going to have to change the same. Um, we're going to have to change the same uh, functions that correspond to the um, to the parts of the grammar that we changed, and we changed the handle ex expression. And I'm not, yeah, I'm not quite sure what else. But let's see. I mean, we have a we have an error here, so we definitely need to support a new kind of expression node here. So let's see. Um, we can look at the concrete syntax tree that we're that we're trying to to deal with right now, and that that's the variable um, expert node. Right, so that looks complicated. Um, but it's indeed um, it's indeed of the type three hundred six, and as we already checked earlier, it's. That's the um, named expression. Oh, wait, it's not named expert test, right? Um, so let's go to the grammar. So we're basically we're basically treating. Um, we're we're in this case, and this is uh, slightly annoying because it can either just recurse to a uh, test um, and then only optionally um, actually has a, um, an actual assignment of expression. Um, so we're going to have to check whether, um, yeah, whether we have only one subtoken and then we can just uh, continue with the first child or whether we have three subtokens um, and then we then we need to actually produce a named expression. Um, so what we can do is up here say uh, I don't know. As I said, this is already is I mean editing this is always very stressful for me because it's so hair the code is so hairy and very hard to understand. Them. Um, right. So let's do this. And maybe we could just put a PDB there and check whether that works. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, there's lots of code like that. For example, here we have. Um, Stuff like okay, if we have more than one child, then we call another method. Otherwise, we just continue with the first child, and, and we're going to need pretty similar code to that. Um, right. Uh, so the node expert node. I think we're actually just we're seeing the same node that we saw before. Um, expert node dot num children is one, and so and then. If we have one child, then, then it's easy. Then we just continue with the first child. Um, get child, I think. And that's uh, some other type. And, and we can just continue with that. And, and it's not our problem. It's, it's another, it's another um, pr um, grammar production that we already had. So the, the remaining code should deal with that just fine. So that's the simple case. Uh, we can say if um, expert node.num children equal one, then we say expert node equal um, expert node dot get child zero, and then we continue. So, and this is the more in interesting case, which is the case where we actually have a colon equal in the line. And then we need to, to actually do something more complicated. But um, if we rerun the test, we should actually hit a case where we, I mean, we should hit the more complicated case because we, we just dealt with the simple cases.
Whoops. Right, waiting, waiting. Right, let's see. So we have the x per node and the num children is three, which as expected. So get child um, zero should be a name. The bottom most uh, terminal is uh, an, the A. And then the, um, the second child is the colon equal and the third child is uh, the right hand side of the assignment expression and in this case it's a it's a value two right um, and so what we need to do now is basically transform that we need to turn this into a name or, or more generally into an assignment target and then this one into an expression and produce a named expression um, ast node um, right so to do that we're going to call Let's look at the grammar again. Um, both of these subcomponents are themselves uh, expressions. So we're going to call handle expression recursively. We can say um, the target expression is uh, self.handle expression um, the, the first child, and that gives us the target. And um, then what else? And then the, the right hand side is basically uh, the same thing, I think, um, with the uh, two, right? It was two, right. Okay, that's good. Um, and then we can um return the named expression let's look at i forgot what par parameters it takes ST compiler st uh, class named expression it takes a target a value and a line and a, and a column so the the uh, value is the expert, the target expert, and the line we're going to take from some token. Uh, it's probably just the the top node, right? And that has a that has a get line node and get column node. Right. Maybe that's enough. I'm not completely sure. Let's, oops. Let's try again. I'm not really looking at the chat. Is there anything happening there? No. Waiting, waiting, waiting. I think there's still something something missing. So let's do that. So the target expression is a name. That's great. And then the value is A. That's promising. And so the right hand side is a num and the value is an, an int object. That's also promising. Um, the thing that I think, and so if we continue now, the, I think that the test, uh, oh no, it didn't pass, so it's called something else. All right, no, it's a typo. It should be expression node here. Okay, expression node. Uh, I'll kill the PDB. But I th I, the thing that I still think is missing is that if you do a, a store, um, like an assignment, you need to set some kind of strange context. I have a, a vague memory that I did that wrong at some point. 
and so I need to re re remember how that worked. But uh, let's let's uh, wait and see whether the test passes. And if it does, then we're actually a big step further because it means we can generate the new um, the new AST token from the assignment expression that um, that we're hoping to get. Right. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. So we're failing in some kind of um, AST uh, visitor. The node visitor is not implemented, and I suspect that self is, uh, is the name. The node is the named exp expression. So there's some kind of validator that that we're calling on the newly generated AST that checks that the AST is valid, and the validator doesn't know what to do with the named expression yet. So that's one thing that we need to look at. And the other thing uh, is I need to keep in mind the, the thing that I just remembered, is the, which is that we, that we need to set the store context somehow. Uh, right. There's even something about a load context here. So let's see. Maybe I can find... Right. There's a set context. And let's see who calls that with item expression statement store yeah i think we need something like that in a in the correct place all right yep so i think we we basically need exactly that uh, on the target expression we need to set the context of that to be a store because it's the left hand side of an assignment okay that's good uh, otherwise, it would have be, it would have blown up in very strange ways very soon. And the other thing that I don't remember at all is this strange validator. Mm. So that needs something. Visit visit that needs a new visitor for the named expression. Let's put it at the bottom, maybe. Named expert. But what what we sh what we're actually doing here is not completely clear to me. Um, yeah, what what the validations actually are for for this thing. Um, I don't quite get what this file does at all. Um, I, sus I suspect at least we should we should validate the components. So let's validate expression uh, node dot um, uh, target and node dot value. Oops. And right value. Uh, that's probably useful. Right. Maybe we can look around a little bit here what this what this um, file does for other cases. As soon as my Vim decides to cooperate again, cooperate again. Right. Uh, wait, I missed the chat. What are you saying? Right. Yeah, that's probably that's plausible. Um, I mean, it, right. A comprehension with no generators. That that kind of stuff. Uh, race with cause, but no exception. Right. Um, sensible things. But I think right, there's an assign here, and I think we need to we need to do the same thing that we do for the assign, which is that we need to say that the left hand side needs to be um, validated in a store context. So um, st dot store like this, I suspect. And def oops. It, expert, right, it takes it optionally takes a context. 
Right, okay, that's at least the minimal thing. I mean, I'm not really properly thinking about errors here. I mean, there, there are wrong cases for ASTs indeed. So, um, uh, indeed, um, as was said on the chat, I, I should forbid something like one colon equal one. Um, and I will do that in a couple of minutes. Let, let's see whether that actually works so far. Expression which can't be assigned to in store context. Uh, no dot target. Ah, hmm. okay, it already works. <laughs> it already checks that we that we can't assign to a num. And the reason for that is that I switched the I messed probably messed up the arguments in the where I construct the uh, named expression. Um, yeah, that, that probably that has to be it because, uh, yeah, so f we get the target first and then the expression, not the other way around. Um, right, but now we all. Uh, I mean, not really what I was going for, but but now we immediately uh, got told that the validator actually does something. It complains if you try to assign to a one in the um, in the named expression. Which is good. Let's see. Right. Okay, so the test still isn't quite right. Expression dot value. Right. So it's wrapped as in an expression statement, I think. So we need to recurse one once more. Uh, but that's not very hard. Uh, fix the test to say dot value here and the other thing that I want to check is uh, target that the target is store right this should be part of the test so assert Target store. We should also check that the target ID is A. Mm. A, and we can check that the um, value dot uh, the value is an int object, right. Well, let's just check that it's a num, actually. Assert expert.value ast.num, right. Um, okay, so the test is a little bit more thorough now. It, it checks more of the component of the generated ast node. Yeah, then the next thing that we're that, that we're going to have to do is uh, once this passes, um, we're going to have to think about um, how to actually generate code for that. Um, right. Right. That that works. Let's look at the diff. Okay. Um, there's some auto-generated stuff which gets generated from um, the changes to the ASDL here. And then there is uh, some new code in the AST builder, which handles the new, um, uh, the, the new gra grammar productions. Um, and then there is a test that checks that the right AST uh, node is generated for a simple assignment expression and um, we validate the new expression and then we we copied over the new production from the 3.8 grammar grammar right that looks good let's actually to be a little bit more thorough let's rerun all the tests in ast builder and oops it's too small probably 
Um, and we can commit that in the meantime. Walrus operator define new AST node type uh, add support in the mm, AST builder. Right. Okay. That looks good, but it would have really surprised me if it didn't. Um, right, while that finishes, we can already start thinking about the next steps. So the next thing we, we want is really an end-to-end -end test, or the next thing I want. Um, really a test that starts um, with a bit of Python code like this and checks that it actually does the assignment. Um, so it probably goes in here. There's a test compiler, I think, and that is right. Let's find a good place for that test. Right, that's an optimization test. Uh, right. So what this thing does is it, it has snippets, snippets of Python code and it runs them through our own compiler and runs them on our own interpreter and um, checks that the right thing happens. And it does hell with, uh, uh, with the Vim uh, syntax highlighting because of all the triple quoted strings. Right. But basically it looks like that. You can say, mm, right, you can say, okay, uh, run this code, then evaluate x, and I expect this value. And we're going to do basically this. Right? Um, so at the end of that class, uh, where's the end of that class here? Um, we're going to have a test that says uh, this past test uh, walrus operator and we can say x equal 1 x and then we want 1 as the result okay and that will fail let's see how it fails um, test test pi compiler no what was it compiler okay walrus Waiting, waiting. I mean, yeah, the waiting is annoying, but uh, the alternative is to have to recompile um, C code all the time. So um, it's not clear which is worse. Right. Okay. The visitor. Some visitor complains that we we don't support this node, and the node is a named expression, and um, the visitor is called the top level code generator so we're going to have to support um, that node type in the in the uh, bytecode compiler so that exists in ast compiler code gen i think right um let's see waiting waiting all right so Python code generator is probably where we want to go. And there's stuff like um, visit all kinds of stuff, visit Lambda. And at the bottom, visit uh, async4. At the bottom, we're going to add a visit named expression. Somewhere. Right. Lots of stuff. Okay, this is a, a custom uh, extension for PyPy's reverse debugger, so we, we can go above that. Um, visit named expert self, 
and it takes uh, a named expert. Right, so what do we have to do? We have to do something like um, we have to um, evaluate the right hand side, then we have to dump it. I mean, we, we looked at the bytecode earlier, do we still have that open? Somewhere at the top, right. Uh, we have to evaluate the right hand side, then we have to use top top to duplicate the top of the stack, and then we use store um, fast or whatever store is appropriate for the um, for the assignment target, and then um, we're done. Right. So let's try that. We say um, named expression dot value dot walkabout. That's that's the name for the visit method. Uh, visit method, and we visit that node with the self as the code generator, and that has the effect that it generates the bytecode for um, the right-hand side of our name, named expression. And now we need to emit a dub top, so that's self.emit op, um, ops.dub top, like this. And um, then what, what, do, what do we do then? Then we need to do the assignment, and I don't quite know how that works. Um, I think maybe it's really just um, named expert.target.walkabout self. Right. Actually, let's step through that uh, just for the fun of it. Um, right. Yeah, that looks plausible. First, we first we generate the bytecode for the right hand side. Then we emit a dub top, and then um, we generate the code for doing the actual assignment, and then we're done. And what's left on the stack is the um, is the value of the expression because um, because of the dub we um, we had we had it twice, and doing the assignment consumes only one, and so. Um, the, the rest of the expression evaluation can use the other value to, to do whatever computation comes off afterwards. That, that looks plausible. Um, right, so now we're in here. Uh, let's see, named expression dot value is a, a num. So let's just for the fun of it, let's step inside there. We update the position. We, we load const the number, right? that we can look at the code that was generated so far, current block dot instructions, right. So we generated a load const, that's good. Now we're back here. So we emit a dub top. Now the bytecode is generated is load const dub top. And then we uh, walk the, um, the left hand side. Uh, let's step in there. Right. What's happening here? Name op, and here it switches on the scope. The scope is three, which should be a global, I suspect. I'm not really sure. Let's see. No, it's a local. Okay. Um, no idea. Let's see what code it actually generated didn't so far. Right, a store name. Okay, that makes sense. Right, it made a store name and then we're done. That looks like reasonable code and executing it actually works. So when we execute it, we we do, I mean, the, the test gets the result that, that we expect it to. And um, it's actually quite a simple test where, where we're not using the fact that um, this evaluates to one at all, so let's actually do something a little bit more complicated. Uh, let's say um, y or even y equal plus five. Um, then x plus y should be what? One plus six, seven. Let's try that. Did I kill the PDB? Mm, nope, I can do that now. Let's try to see whether that works too.
Okay, stuff is happening. Right. Okay, that works. So, I mean, in, in, in many ways, the bytecode generation side of name expression is very simple because it's really just, uh, it, it, it's, it very directly maps to bytecodes that, that um, the, um, the virtual machine already has. So it's not that surprising that um, once we actually manage to get all the machinery in place, like the new grammar rules and the new, um, the new uh, AST node and, and stuff like that, that the actual code generation is, is quite simple. So um, I'm, not, I'm not completely surprised that um, sort of the, uh, yeah, the complexity was more in, in all the setup stuff, but it's still kind of cool that, it, that, that we're done now. So let's look. Right, that's a very simple diff. We can commit that. Um, Walrus operator add bytecode generation. Cool. So I'm quite happy with that. Let's run some of the other test compiler tests, which are taking a while, but um, I suspect again that they should just pass. Right. Right, so while we wait, please, if you have questions, just, just write them in the chat. Um, we can do something while we wait. Um, or if, there, if there's anything that you want me to um, explain in more detail or, or whatever, just let me know. Yeah, something that we that we definitely, I mean, we did the first end-to-end -end test, but there are a number of corner, ca corner cases that we didn't really think about. Um, thanks, Mati. Um, yeah, I will do that. Um, there are a, a couple of corner cases that, that we didn't really think about, um, and one of them is... Uh, I mean, there, I'm fairly sure that there are some things that CPython forbids around um, Wal the Walters operator. Uh, and we we didn't really we didn't really look at those corner cases yet. So let's actually look a little bit here at the test. Ah, oh, it's here. Um, open them here right um, we should go and and make sure that a, a couple of them um, of these actually fail in the same way um, and for a few of them, I'm not really that worried because, I mean, this first one is forbidden by the grammar, so um, it should just immediately give a, um, I, yeah, I don't really understand the, re the, the newest question. Why do I need to do anything in the symbol table? Ah, I see, to get this kind of error. Right. Right, that sounds complicated. So this is only the error cases. Let's check comprehension. <laughs> this is a very complicated error message. Um, 
I would like a case that actually works, not all the cases that don't work. Right. Okay. Let's let's actually start with the with the case that you suggested. I'm going to copy it and um, so okay. This is still running. Python three point eight. Uh, let's see. Uh, so x in y print x. Uh, import this, 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 f, Ooh, do I understand that? So here it, it makes the, right, it produces a closure and then an up value, correct? Store deref, right? Yeah, it's a bit complicated because you're using y and y twice, so I, I suppose, ah, Okay, I'm waiting. Mm. Wait, I'm too lazy, let me copy it. Right, um, this, let's look at the disassembly. I'm not really sure that, that we need to do something super special because um, the Y already occurs in a store context. So I suspect that the, that the, um, the cell handling already, like the, the up value handling already does the correct thing, but we should definitely have a test for that. Um, right, this, I mean, this is CPython, right? So I'm, I'm looking at how CPython does it. And what it does is it, it uses store deref here. But we should have it, we should definitely have a test for that. Um, let's copy this and go here. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I was not really aware of all the subtleties, it seems. Um, Okay, so let's do something more complicated. Um, so we can define the function the foo, and then oops, and then we don't actually print it, but we return it. Mm, return y, and then what we should get here is we should. If we evaluate foo, we should get four. I think that um, that's the test we want, and, and we should just run it and see whether it works or not. I'm not actually completely sure. Um, okay, running it, um, it might just work, but I'm. I mean, as I said, I'm. I'm not really sure. I mean, in many ways, the bytecode compiler isn't really, I mean, it's, it's a very stable piece of code, right? I mean, um, there, there are only very occasional changes to that. And so I'm not really super intimately familiar with all the bits of it. Um, and how scopes are exactly computed, ah, crap, um, is not really in my work, working memory.
Aha. Okay, you're right. So there is a problem. And the problem indeed is that it doesn't properly um, use this as a... I mean, it doesn't escape to the outer scope. So we need to, we need to see how that works. Uh, let's actually look at the bytecode that is generated by PyPy now. And um, we have a frame, so we have the code and we can disassemble this. Right. So it, um, right, it has the, the code of object of the list comprehension and it, it has a store fast of Y here and it should be a store deref um, so it, it, it's indeed wrong here. So we found a problem here. And the thing that I'm going to do there is actually try, I mean, maybe at least quickly look at the code that C, uh, how CPython does that, because I actually have, I mean, no, wait, something before I do that, maybe I can actually look at the, um, at the, where is it? names at the sum table handling. So this is the code that computes whether something is a local, a global, a free variable or a cell or, or whatever. And um, is there something about comprehensions here? Right. And I think it should start a new scope somewhere. But as I said, I don't really understand this code at all, right? Visit list com calls visit comprehension and that starts a new function scope, pushes that scope on the stack, right? And so, so something special needs to happen here. Let me actually briefly look at what CPython does. Git blame uh, lib test test named expression. Right, this is the commit, git show. Right. Oops. Lots of stuff. Right, sim table. of tests. Mm, more tests. Tokenizing tests. What's that? Exceptions. There's a new ex exception. Interesting. Ah, there's a new expression context. So maybe this, maybe supporting this is actually pretty hairy. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you should just, you could have just stolen the Py, the PyPy one, which is already in Python. Um, ah, okay, fair enough. Um, right, but it seems that there is a new kind of expression context called named store, which I'm currently not properly using. So maybe I maybe that's the first thing I need to investigate. Um, right. Mm. Stuff. 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 Don't really care. Right. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, one thing we definitely need to do is to, um, right, that looks, that looks helpful. One thing we definitely need to do is to, to add this new, um, to add this new store context. Um, Right. Um, 
we need to add this new store context for named expressions, which is a named store, and then um, we need to handle that a lot more carefully. Um, ah, okay. So that was just in the original commit, but it's but it's gone now. Okay, fair enough. Um, that's good. Right. I, I should. Right. Right. Thanks. Um, that makes sense. Uh, but still, in the sum table. Wait, that. What does it look like? If if we if we do a handle named expression in the sum table, and we're in the context of uh, comprehension, then we need to. Um, do something special in any case. Right. right now we didn't add any special kind of um, right. Yeah. So we need to add a visit named expression here. I mean so far it was using the so far, it was using. I think we have we have the information of whether we're in a comprehension or not. Um, but I was wondering how it worked at all. But I think there is a default implementation of the visit named expert that just recurses on the sub nodes that was doing something somewhat sensible. Um, so that's why we we weren't getting an error here about um, not having a visitor for named expert. So let's actually do that. PDB, and this should say self. Uh, node.target.walkabout. Uh, I mean, that's the default implementation, self and um, value, right? And we need to do something special here and, and what I, I don't quite know. And I'm going to investigate that by um, poking, I mean, starting the, uh, that and poking a little bit around um, of, what the, of what the context looks like. So let's look at comprehension again. Um, so it makes a function scope. Where's the function? Right. Maybe the scope doesn't really know yet. It only knows whether it's a generator. It doesn't know whether it's a... Um, whether it's uh, comprehension, so we might need that. Okay, so that looks like another useful comment. Um, named expert scope. Uh, oops. All right. Oh wow, that's really complicated. Yeah, I see what you mean by dark corner. It's definitely not as simple as I thought it was. Right, right, right. Lots of corner cases. Right. Right. Uh, okay. Let's see what we have here. The first case is the simple case, right? Uh, self is the sim table builder and we have the scopes uh, right that's the stack of scopes and we have a um, a module scope and a I know that's a dictionary why is that a dictionary what does push scope actually do ah there's a stack right there's a stack of scopes that's great great um, yeah, actually having looking at the Python implementation is useful. I might do that in a minute when I'm first trying to understand again how the PyPy code actually works. So we have this stack of scopes and we, we, we're going to have to walk that backwards until we find either 
was it either a function scope or a module scope or a class scope and in a class scope we're just uh, going to raise an error um, right and to do that we walk this stack backwards that's good so the question is more how do we know whether the scope that we're currently in is a comprehension i don't think we have that information at the moment um, function scope async function scope class scope comprehension is a function scope right So there are various scope classes, the base class, and then subclasses, module scope, function scope, async function scope, class scope. And I suspect the PyPy approach would be to have a new, uh, I don't know, who sets this is generator thing? Ah, right, it finds it out by, okay, that makes sense. Mm. Let's actually be a little bit brute force and say is generator false and then at the place um, at the place where we make the function scope for the comprehension we can say new scope dot comprehension is comprehension oops what did I call it. Not this apparently. Hmm. Right, it's a bit hacky. We might instead want um, a new subclass class core of function co scope called um, uh, called uh, comprehension scope or something like that. Okay, so now we have a flag that we can inspect and now we can go to here and do something of the extreme cleverness that um, that uh, CPython seems to be doing. Though I actually wonder, can we, are there any more Unity tests for this kind of code? It seems so. Right. We might actually want to have, want to write a unit test here. But I don't quite know what it would look like yet. Right. Non-local tests. Yeah. Uh. Right. Um, so where was the test that we wrote before here? We're going to take that. And in the sim table tests, um, we're going to do something similar. So what, what's that on the chat? I'm not catching up. Okay, that's the Python implementation. That's very interesting. Um, Cool. What's this project? Uh, ha! Yes, very cool. Right. Makes sense. Right. So the default is really to to, to do nothing complicated at all. But then if we are in a comprehension, then we're, we have to do very complicated stuff. I'm not sure I understand this case here. Mm. Right, 
So let's try this. So self.funcscope and what we want to know is whether within that function scope um, lookup of uh, y should be something like scope uh, cell I suspect. I'm not quite sure, but that look, sounds plausible. And if we run that, it will probably just completely fail. Test named expression, no wait, sim table named expert. You're making strong inferences about uh, us using similar, ending up with similar names, but I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's likely that they're true. What did I call it? Wait, ah, ah, name the expert. No, no, it's uh, it sounds plausible. Anyway, I mean, right now I will I will just get a name error, right? Because right now the it doesn't appear at all in the outer scope. So um, so it's a good enough test that shows us that we have a problem. Um, Right. Uh, what I wrote here is nonsense. It's just this. Okay, let's see. Wait, we're not. We're just setting it. We're not. We're not using it at all. At all yet. Uh, so self dot scope. Yes comprehension is true right so scope equals self dot scope and if scope is a function scope and scope dot is comprehension then we need to do something complicated that I don't know what yet but right when we continue we get a zero which I don't know what it means or other scopes defined it's a blank um, so that's definitely wrong, and I'm not really sure whether um, whether local or, or whatever is correct. Um, uh, but scope unknown is definitely wrong. Um, right. Okay. So let's get to work. Let's start with a simple case. What does C Python do? It walks the stack of scopes um, backwards. So let's do that. For i in range len self dot stack minus one minus one minus one um, parent equals self dot stack uh, i right and then we need to s check on ah, does it the other way around right this is an error case i'm going to ignore that for a little bit right hmm. 
I need to understand this file a little bit more before I continue. There should be another... Who else walks this stack? Nobody. I mean, there, there should be... There should be more code that walks up the stack to to um, notice if variables are closed over. I think maybe not. Maybe maybe it walks the other way around and it inherits. Maybe it inherits the uh, the names that are known so far from the top or something. Mm-hmm. Bit out of my depth here. What does it actually do if it sees a name? Right. Calls note symbol. Right. Yeah, so, so it is really fairly strange behavior in some ways. Okay, so what our current theory is if this is a function scope, then we do something special and then there's more code for uh, module scope and class scope. So those are the three cases that we need to think about, and we're currently in this one. Um, and uh, let me actually... Oh, wait, where am I failing? I'm failing in a way that I didn't really think. Um, okay, so what CPython does is it says if we're in a function block then we check whether we already have the, then we get the symbol and we check whether it's a global um, And if it's a okay, right? I don't understand the C Python code enough either. So this wonderful Python code is doing what it um, right? So if if the If it's in the outer scope, if it's global there, then it's going to be global in our inner scope. And if it's non-local there, it's going to be... Um, otherwise, it's going to be non-local here. And um, then we just add a definition with with set flag. And I think we can replicate that. Uh, we can say... Um, how does it work? Parent... Wait. Parent. Uh, oh, okay, so we need to skip one. Uh, we need to skip one more scope because otherwise we're in the current scope, which is what we don't want. Um, right. I'm, let's restart it. Um, look up something. <laughs> so, okay, do we have the parent as the function scope and it has 
symbols none of course and if we do a look up here of uh, node.target.id Mm. Not sure that's how it works. Because parent doesn't have any symbols, right? Uh, okay, I'm lost. I'm fairly lost. I think in the end we need to call node symbol here somehow. Wait, where, where were we? We need to call node dot. Uh, no parent dot node symbol with some arguments and um, but and either we need to note it as a global or as a non-local but uh, which of these I'm um, how do we how we actually gather the correct information I'm um, I'm a little bit lost uh, yeah it's I think what um, but no, but according to the code that CPython does, it doesn't always um, right. In, in the parent, I need to. Ah, are you sure? Let me let me check your code again. So, in the ah in self, you're you're adding the definition as a ah in the parent, it's always a local. Okay, that's easier. But I'm. I don't understand why I need to do this lookup on the self and switch on whether it's a, a global or a, a non-local there. That that part I don't understand at all. Um, is that equivalent to... Right, CPython looks it up in the parent. Um, I'm not even sure that what, what the CPython code does is um, equivalent to the code here, because CPython seems to look it up in the parent and then switch on whether it's a global there, and this code switches on um, does a lookup in the current scope, which is the comprehension scope, and then. Um, switches on that uh, there. So those two don't really seem to agree. So I'm a, a bit lost. Um, but yeah, one theory indeed is to just to say that in the parent, we, we want to say that it's a scope local, right? I mean, that definitely seems to be what's happening here, right? In the current scope, it's um, it's a local, and in the no, which one is the parent? The parent is STE, and the current scope, which is the comprehension, is STE. Ah, fair enough. Yeah, okay, got it. Um, so my time is kind of running out. I have maybe 10 more minutes. I'm going to try to stare at this a little bit more, but... Um, we're, I'm probably not going to 
completely finished this now, but uh, I think I, I definitely understood more of the complexities, which is a which is a, a good and necessary step to actually um, get somewhere. Right, this whole thing only happens if, if the outer block is an extension, right? I remembered that correctly. Um, right. Right, if it's in the if it's a global in the parent, we're adding it as, as a global in the current one. And we're I don't really see yet where we are adding it to the parent in the C code. We don't, I think. I think that what the C code does is... Um, let's see. Yeah, thanks for all this help. I would be even more lost. Uh, ah, there's an STE here, right? I was just, I was concentrating on this ST here. Okay, right. Okay, so we always add it as a, you, you, what you said, what you wrote before is correct. We, we always add it as a local to the parent and to the current we add it either as a global or as a non-local depending on whether before it was a, a global in the parent. Right. Um, right. Okay, so let's... Let's try to do that. First, we're getting the name. So, um, um, let's actually add an assert here that it's that it actually is a name. Um, which right now is maybe not true, but um, it should be true if we add more tests. So uh, that's target.id. So node symbol is correct. We node symbol uh, name here. And Where did, where's my, where did my if go? Um, parent function scope. No, right. Um, and now we want to have a switch if parent dot something um, scope equal uh, scope global. I'm not even sure what the difference between the two is else scope equals scope non and we don't have a a scope non-local so we need to figure out what the equivalent of these is maybe yeah, i'm not really sure it doesn't take a scope anyway it takes a it takes a sum something right so it takes a sum local which I'm not sure what that is. And here it should be a sim global or a 
Sim. Uh, Non-local. And here we're saying scope dot node symbol name uh, scope. So that's plausible. And the only thing that's left um, is to figure out how we do the lookup. Um, and we can say, what did we? What didn't work here? Lookup. That should always work now because we added the node symbol here and uh, we can say name. And the only thing left is uh, to figure out how to spell local in, in this. Um, no, no um, yeah, I, I figured out that global implicit, global explicit aren't really the right, uh, the right constants. The constants that I need aren't really from the second block. They're, they're sort of the, the, the output for the code generator. So the internal thing is really this first block and, and uh, that, that really just has some global and some non-local. And, and the only thing that I don't um, know is what, uh, what local is, but it seems that uh, sum assign might be the right one. So let's try sum assigned. Um, right. Uh, let's put the PDB here and after we found the parent scope, do we stop or do we go up the whole stack? Mm. We just go up. There is no break or anything that I can see. What about the C code? There is a return here. Um, right. I think I'm going to go with break here. Okay, let's try what happens. Right. I'm not really sure yet. Just, right, we just return to the parent, which then walks, um, which then walks the value and the target anyway. So that's what what I'm doing here now. Um, I have a break and then I do the walk of the target and the value, right? Okay, let's see. Nah, tough luck. I did this wrong. Oops. Yeah, first draft or not, looking, having, and being able to look at your Python code was super helpful. What's the what's the goal of, of that pure Python compiler? Okay. Once again, parent, that's the function scope and right, then we know that. Um, ah, oh wait, this lookup is missing something here. Why is that? I don't understand that. I think I need to note some kind of assignment, not just a, not, I'm using the, the wrong kind of note. I need to, I need to note this differently. This is not enough. Right. Might have to say sum assigned or something. No, I am. I'm a bit clueless.
right? I can only do lookup after I did, after I called finalized name. So, so I, at this point in time, I can't really say, I, I can't really use that function at all, right? Um, yeah, node node name. It's it's kind of a two two step process. Node name, wait. Uh, node name. Um, where is it? Stores stuff into the dictionary roles, but lookup looks up things in symbols. So there's roles here and symbols, and symbols is really only. Um, populated after you called finalize, which I suspect is something that you do on all the scopes after um, after walking all the ASTs. So I might not be able to use that API here. Um, right, yes. So maybe I should say lookup role instead. Yeah, what happens if I say, um, parent dot look up role name right then I get then I get a result role and this should be equals some global I think I mean this stuff definitely needs more careful test tests um, But yeah, that, that looks plausi plausibly close to what uh, the C Python and, and, and the other Python compiler um, are doing. So uh, I'm going to believe it for the moment. But yeah, it, need, it definitely needs lots of refinement. It needs some, um, it needs more tests to cover all the cases. And um, yeah, I, I need to try harder to break it and look at all, some of the corner cases. Probably yes. Uh, right. Ah, yes. Well, that should be parent. I oh, know that should be. Ah, okay, I'm overriding that. Uh, No, it shouldn't be self. Self is something else. Self is the sim table builder, which is a visitor. But um, it has a scope, which is um, scope, and that's what I was overriding here. Okay, once more, that looks plausible, break, duck, duck, and what happens now? Now the lookup is five, and five is not zero, which is what we got before. It is scope cell, and I think that's actually what I would, would be expecting, because it needs to be in a cell for the uh, code in the, um, in the subscope, in the, in the list comprehension to uh, refer upwards to the value in the in the outer scope so that actually matches what I think I would hope to get right um, yeah I mean one of the cool parts of Piper is really that in the end it's really just Python right and you can you can hack around and it's um, and it's debuggable with uh, PDB and and you just use PyTest to write stuff and um, so so in some in some some sense for some of the stuff that we're looking at now like the like the microcompiler and and the interpreter it's really quite approachable um, I mean maybe maybe in some other stream we can write cool uh, that's pretty cool 
um, maybe in some other stream we can actually look at some of the bytecodes and, and some of them some of the interpreter internals so let me actually run now wait um, so the the tests for the um, the tests for the sim table um, worked and now I'm going to run the compiler test to see whether it actually also does the right thing, but I'm fairly hopeful that it does. And then I'll commit that and maybe push and, and call it a night. Yeah, please do. If, if you, um, I mean, HD is not that different. It's a little bit different, but it, um, it's not, it's not a really a huge step. I mean, it takes a little bit to be to get comfortable, but it's not it's not a completely different system. The mental model is pretty similar. Cool. Okay, there's still some there's still some uh, cases missing, but and some tests missing. But I'm going to commit that. Uh, in, Walrus operator in progress. Start to deal with the complexities of um, of list comprehensions. I'm actually going to um, so we have this kind of convention to mention other people in the commit message that were involved in the commit somehow and given that I um, given that I would never have figured that out on my own thanks is identical I'm going to mention you here um, right okay let's see Push new branch. Um, okay, I think that's it from me for today. Um, that was really great. Thanks everybody for the for the. Uh, for joining me and um, giving me such great feedback and, and great suggestions. And um, I'm, I mean, I don't really know how regular of a thing I might, I'm, I'm going to try to do that, but I mean, I really enjoyed tonight, so I might, uh, I might do it in a similar way uh, fairly soon. I still have some days off and, and should be able to have some time sort of at the, um, at a similar, at a similar time. Um, yeah, thanks everybody and see you all later.